Thank you for a great introduction, uh, Kubeb, and welcome everyone. I see Alan is joining from LA. I just came back from LA uh, from a wonderful uh, conference and causality called Clear. Um, so I enjoyed a little bit of sunny weather, but also a little bit of rainy weather, which was surprising to me to experience this in, in California in, in the spring. Today's um, presentation is about an intersection or the intersection of causality and natural language processing. And we'll talk a little bit about large language models, about generative AI, but also about other language models, not necessarily generative ones, like BERT. But before we start, I want to introduce you to Jean-Henri Fabre. Jean-Henri Fabre was a scientist who lived uh, between 18th and 19th century. And uh, he also, he studied, he, he studied many different life, life forms, including insects. And one of his famous experiments involved a species of, of a species of moth called pine processionary. It's called pine processionary because those moths here as, as a larvae, they consume uh, consume pines, different parts of pines. And processionary comes from the fact that they go, they follow each other. So when one when one caterpillar is uh, walking in certain direction, another one will follow it very, very closely. So what you see here on the picture is is not one organism. There's 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 like a couple of dozens of of caterpillars. They're just following each other so so closely that there is almost no there's almost no uh, free space between them. And so what he did in one of his experiments, he put them in a in a circle, like a closed circle. And what turned out somehow surprisingly was that they continued walking in the circle. So he was interested if if he put some food in their proximity, will they break the circle and go into the direction of food? So he put some uh, some pine needles, if I remember correctly, in the middle of the circle on uh, on a little little kind of a pod, and it turned out that the caterpillars were still walking in the circle. And after seven days walking in the circle, very close to the food, very sadly, all of them died. So it took them seven days of repeating the same behavior that led to their uh, tragic end. So what's in this story for, for us today? Let's think about predictive machine learning. Traditional machine learning is, is mostly predictive. And that means that we have models that observe some data during the training process. And then based on this data, based on the either representation or the patterns, speaking maybe more generally, uh, found in this data, they generate some kind of prediction. What can go wrong with this? Uh, a couple of years ago, I think three years ago, there was a very uh, a very famous failure of uh, of traditional machine learning models in a company called in the company called Zillow. So Zillow had a house flipping model. So they are trying to predict prices of of houses, and then based on this information, they were buying houses that were underpriced and were maybe renovating them, and then and then selling. At some point, they bought a lot of houses and then it turned out that they cannot sell these houses for the prices that they thought they will be able to sell them. And so this ended up in billions of dollars of losses. So what's the challenge here? The challenge here is the biggest lie of machine learning. This is the phrase that I learned recently from Bernard Schulkopf. Uh, if you don't know Bernard Schulkopf, Bernard Schulkopf is one of, I think it's fair to say, one of the godfathers of modern machine learning. He was a student of Vapnik uh, in the in the 90s. 
and he has a lot of contributions to machine learning. And currently, he works. Uh, he works. He focuses his work, um, among other things, on causality and causal machine learning. So, what's this biggest light of machine learning? This is the fact that machine learning only works on IID data. IID stands for independent and identically distributed, which means, um, which means that the training data defines the space where those models can work. In other words, those models cannot generalize beyond the training distribution. And of course, we could, if we take a little bit more nuanced view on this, we could perhaps say that huh, sometimes those models can interpolate. So that would be that would be an intuition that we take from uh, from simple models like linear regression, right? We don't observe all the points on the on the line. Usually, the line is is a, is a fit to the data, and we interpolate between different different points where we don't observe any data. And but it turns out that this intuition about interpolation doesn't hold in high dimensions. So, generally speaking, and maybe simplifying this a little bit, those models do not generalize beyond the training distribution. And this means that when a change happens in the world, and this change is different than anything that those models have seen during the training, those algorithms cannot adapt to this change. And they follow a path that they learn in the training. So whatever changes in the world um, in a way that is that haven't been seen in training data, those models will ignore. And that's in a sense, um, and that's in a sense what happened with, with Zillow. The deeper reason behind all of this is that there's a limit to what we can learn from observations. And traditionally, uh, we train machine learning models on observational data. And some of us can think that modern generative AI is different in, in, in this regard. And uh, perhaps it is, but maybe it's not that different. So this is a prompt that comes from the landing page of Sora, a text to video model recently released by, by OpenAI. And the prompt says five gray wolf paths rollicking and chasing each other around a remote gravel road surrounded by grass. The paps run and leap, chasing each other, nipping, and so on. And the video looks like this. So this is a very smooth video. But if you look carefully, there is some challenge going on there. There's something that's going on there. We can see it once again. Okay. So you can you can let me know in the chat what's what is concerning here in this video. You can share in the chat. And in the meanwhile, waiting for your responses, I want to go to the next slide. And so what can we say? What can we say about this? AI has no concept of matter, said Dave. Okay, wolf paths seem to be generated out of thin air. Things appear out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. The number of them seems to be growing. They started as free. That's from Betty. Yeah, these are great comments. And so, so exactly. So we see that there is something that we would not expect to see in the real world. And we can see also in this video that all those transitions are very, uh, very smooth. And they are smooth even if they are not realistic. And if we think about statistical learning, this per perfectly makes sense because the model is learning what is probable, what is likely to happen in the either embedding space or the pixel space close to a point where, where we focus our attention. And so if we look at those videos, if we, if we would zoom in into very small pieces of those videos, what we would see would probably make sense to us. But if we look at, the, at it globally and we want to see something that um, 
resembles what we observe in, in our reality, then a problem starts. And this problem uh, comes from the fact that is closely related to what Dave mentioned in the chat. So Dave said, once again, AI has no concept of matter. And I call it slightly differently, but I think this is pretty much the same idea. So this is the idea of world models. World model means that we understand we understand the data generating process. We, we do not only look at the data and we are not trying to, to guess what would be a likely thing that would occur close in time or close in space, but we understand what is the process behind the, behind the data. This is Santino. Santino is, it was a chimp living in a Swedish zoo called Furuvik. And unfortunately, Santino died tragically uh, last year or maybe a year and a half. But why Santino became famous is that he was behaving in a way, in some aspects, he was behaving in a way that many male chimpanzees are behaving. But in some aspects, uh, he surprised some people with his behaviors. And one of those people is Matthias Oswald, a cognitive scientist from Swedish Lund University, who studied Santino's behaviors. And this is a title of one of his papers that was uh, devoted to, to those behaviors. It's called Spontaneous Innovation for Future Deception in a Male Chimpanzee. So what was so special about Santino? What was not special about Santino is that he was displaying so-called dominance behaviors. Dominance behaviors uh, are aiming at showing dominance, basically, and male chimps are doing this, and that's very natural for them, uh, or we think it's natural for them. But Santino was also doing something, something else. Uh, one of his dominant behaviors were, was throwing stones at the audience, so people who were gathering around his uh, his island where he was living. And that, of course, well, that maybe that was cool for him, but not so cool for for the people. So the zoo workers were coming to his island to collect the stones and take them take them away, take them from the island. So he so he doesn't have munition right to to throw at people. They were very surprised, though, because after one of those sessions of cleaning the island from anything that he could throw at, at people, it turned out that he was still throwing stuff at people. And what turned what, what turned out after after further invest, in, investigation was that Santino was actually storing those uh, rocks, and not only rocks, but also pieces of concrete that you can see here. Uh, in a place where he knew that the zoo workers will not look for them. So he was also able to, those uh, concrete blocks, as it turned out uh, at some at some point, he was knocking them, knocking them out from the from the pit, from the pit um, surrounding his island. And he was doing this during the time when there was no water uh, and when nobody was was looking. So Santino was inhibiting his, his um, behaviors and he was hiding those projectiles in a way that suggests that he had a very precise world model, which means that he was able to think about a situation when somebody is coming to his island to take the rocks and put those rocks in a place where he assumed that this person will not look for them, okay? So this also involves something that we would call counterfactual reasoning. And before we go further, I want to quickly introduce myself. Um, we already had a, a quick introduction, but I want to expand on this a little bit. So I'm a consultant, educator, researcher, uh, author of uh, this book on causality, causal inference, and discovery in Python. Uh, you can find out more about the book here. I'm also host of the Causal Bandits podcast, where we talk with 
some of the finest, brightest minds in causality um, about a variety of topics related to causality, generalization, artificial general intelligence, uh, and, and all the stuff that is related to this, world models and so on. So you can find out about the podcast and some other also free resources when you scan this QR code. And in my private life, I love traveling with my wife and I enjoy good vegan food. And here on this picture, you can see uh, my wife and the motorcycle that we took uh, during one of our trips in Costa Rica. And here at the back of the motorcycle are all of our belongings wrapped in trash bags. So what? Why? Why? Why have we done this? We, we've done this because before, uh, before starting the our our trip on that day, I was like I I think like three or five hundred kilometers, and we checked the weather forecast, and it turned out that it's going that it's going to to rain somewhere on our way, and because we knew that our bags were not water resistant. We wrap them in those in those bags, and this also involved a world model. So we needed to think about, hey, what would happen if we don't put those things in in those trash bags versus what will happen if we will put them in the trash bags? So we knew something about trash bags that they are water resistant, and so on and so on. And for any human being, this sounds pretty trivial, right? We are just preparing for a trip; it's so normal. But when we want to encode this kind of reasoning in machines, it turns out that it, it is very, very far away from, from trivial. Okay. So what's, the, what's in this story for, uh, for us, for our topic today? The main question of, of today main underlying question, because maybe there are some other also more technical questions, is can large language models help us with causal reasoning? So we learned in the beginning that uh, the caterpillars follow a distribution that they learned before. And if something changes in the world, there's some intervention in the world, they not necessarily adapt to this intervention if it's outside of what they, in a sense, know. And by no, I mean also the evolutionary, uh, evolutionary quote unquote knowledge. And we've seen that, <clears throat> that machine learning models, traditional machine learning models behave in a similar way. So if something changes in the world in a way that is somehow different than what those models have seen in the training data, they will also follow this old path. So they, metaphorically speaking, they will stay within the circle uh, regardless of what is happening around them. So we said something about observations. We said something about interventions. And when we, we're talking about Santino and the story uh, with, with the motorcycle, we also said something about counterfactuals and counterfactual reasoning. So all those terms are closely related to what we say, what we think, um, what, closely related to what we think uh, a ca causality is. But we haven't defined it yet. So what is causality? Here's one definition that comes from Wikipedia, particularly from a web page about causality in physics. And the definition says, causality is the relationship between causes and effects. I would like to ask you to let me know in the chat what you think about this, this definition. Do you think it's a good definition? And if so, why? And if you think that there are some drawbacks to this definition, also please share your thoughts. Why do you think so? And what those, what those um, drawbacks would be? I'll wait a second for your replies. So let's see if the, what you think about this definition. Do you think it's a good definition of causality? Seems redundant, said, said to Richard. Thank you, Richard. Let's see what other people say. Let's 
seems justifiable. I think it's pretty good. So just one. It does not clarify against correlation, said Evo. Mm -hmm. And Kenneth said, it seems okay. Mm -hmm. So these are all, all, all the points are, are great. Aristotle had four components, material, efficient, and final, said Mike. Yeah, so Aristotle, so that's very interesting what, uh, what Aristotle was saying about causality, I agree. It's not something computers can evaluate, this definition. Yes, I agree. Okay, that's great. Thank you. I appreciate the comments. Uh, I agree with Richard personally that uh, this definition is redundant in a sense, and, and, and maybe we could also say it's circular because it tries to define causality with causes, and we don't still know what causes are, right? A closely related, a closely related notion. Uh, Lisa here asks if relationship can also be correlation. And yeah, this definition does not clarify anything. That says, hey, there are some causes, some effects, maybe th these are some events, and there is some relationship between them, but it doesn't say anything about the direction. So in this sense, it does not differentiate between uh, causal direction and, and just something that is correlational. Uh, perhaps this is implicitly uh, that was implicitly intended by the author uh, to be to be uh, encoded in words causes and effects, but it's not said explicitly here. Difference between correlation. Mm -hmm. So great, thank you for your comments. Um, so I, I think this definition is not very clear and it's not very helpful. And as somebody said here in the chat, it would also be difficult to translate this definition into something that could be evaluated by a machine or translate to something, uh, some process, right? That would follow this definition that could be encoded by, by a machine. And so I want to propose a different definition today uh, that comes from Judy Pearl. Judy Pearl is a godfather of, of modern causality, especially computational modern causality. And his definition is very, very simple, yet also very actionable or practical. And it just says A is a cause of B if B listens, quote unquote, to A. So what does it mean, listens to A? Well, in a nutshell, it means that if we change something in A, we also expect a change in B. Let's say maybe um, to be more precise, we could say, that we expect this change on average or in general, right? Because maybe there are some ranges of change in A that do not lead to a, a change in B, but in general, we expect this, this change. And so this definition is an interventional definition, which means that intervention means a change. If we act in the world, if we change something in the world and so on. And this is a very good time now to ask a question how those things like intervention and counterfactuals are related. Uh, Betty asks, why does he use word listen rather than respond? Uh, I think this is, this is just like licencia poetica in a sense, just a, just a choice like this. Of course, there is a formal version of this definition as well, but there are no verbs, right? So, um, so you can always refer to it, but I think listen here is just like a, like a poetic kind of choice. Yeah, so great. So I want to introduce you to this concept of the ladder of causation. So the ladder of causation is a metaphor that helps us understand or structure what we think about causation or what we think about different levels of relationships between variables. And so the ladder of causation, it has been introduced by Judea Pearl in one of his in a, one of his books. And it has three ranks. And the first rank is association. The second one is intervention. And the third one is counterfactual. Each rank is related to some action, some, let's say, verb, quote unquote. And also, is related to a formal language that allows us to exp express the um, really that relationship uh, relationships between different variables on, at those different ranks. And so the the association associational rank is related to observing, and this is also related to 
or any type of association in the data. So we can say correlation or any generalization thereof. Uh, it could be maybe a measure theoretic, something very, very, uh, very, very general, a measure theoretic measure of association. Then intervention is related to doing or acting or intervening. So the second rung is related to intervening. And if we talk about, if we can use correlations to express associations, we use something that is called a do operator to express interventions. And in do calculus, which is formalism from Perl, we can express some of the interventional queries in statistical, purely statistical terms under certain conditions. And this will be important for us to let later on today. And finally, we have this counterfactual level and the action related to counterfactuals is imagining. So this is like thinking about different possible trajectories in the world. And I told you that the ladder of causation is a metaphor, and that's true, but it's far away, it's very far from, from the, on, the only true about the ladder of causation. It's also a formal system. Uh, that defines that there is a definition of three different formal languages that allow us to um, talk about those different levels of relationships between variables in a formal, in a formal sound way. It can also be seen from a topological perspective. If somebody, uh, if somebody here is interested in mathematics, and. Uh, there's also a measure theoretic, a very recent attempt to 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 provide a measure theoretic axiomatization of causality that also uses the ladder of of causation. Okay, so let's talk about now when we know a little bit about what causality is. Let's talk about large language models and causality, or language models and causality. So. Where are we today with large language models when it comes to when it comes to causality? Here is a um, an example, a, a an example problem from my book, um, described in natural language, and the description goes like this: John has coffee sensitivity. He drank coffee in the morning, and now his stomach hurts. Would his stomach hurt if he had not drank the coffee? And in the book, we treat this uh, problem description or this situation description as as a t as a as a toy example and we solve it formally with numbers so we have some data and we have a model and we we answer this question uh, using a formal model that allows us to reason counterfactually uh, but here we we don't have any data we just have a problem description and we are interested in what the the large language model will tell us this is uh, GPT 3.5, if I remember correctly. And so the answer is no, his stomach would not hurt if he had not drunk coffee, assuming that his coffee sensitivity is the only cause of his stomach ache. If John has a sensitivity to coffee, then drinking coffee can cause adverse, adverse reactions in his body, such as stomach pain, and so on and so on. And so this is a very, very promising uh, response. Actually, it's correct. And you can you can see that we go we reach the same conclusion uh, reasoning formally in the book and that the model proposed proposed here but this is a little bit anecdotal right so let's see what happens if we try to benchmark a model like this in a way that is a little bit more systematic using something maybe a benchmark so <clears throat> so these are results from a paper by Emre Kijiman and colleagues from Microsoft research who used a number of benchmarks here, a CRAS benchmark, CRAS counterfactual reasoning benchmark, to assess performance of different uh, large language models. As, and here in the orange, you, you have human performance, which is pretty close to 100%, uh, not 100 precisely, but pretty close. And in the second uh, row, in the yellow, you have GPT-4, and you can see that the performance is very, very good. It's actually pretty close to human. So this sounds very promising. And what we said, we said before, hey, this, there is some limitation what we can learn from observations. 
uh, without intervening in the world and so on and so on. But here, those large language models trained on data, just, you know, just like textual data, they can suddenly perform stuff like this. So how is that uh, possible? So this sounds exciting and, and, and this sounds interesting. But what turns out is that they also fail in very unpredictable ways. So sometimes maybe if we give even a very, very simple example to those models, they actually fail to respond correctly. So what is going on here? If we try to, if we try to benchmark those models in an even more systematic way, taking into account what data those models could have seen during the training, it turns out that their performance drops very significantly. So here you can see a large a large benchmark coming from coming from this paper. Can large language models infer causation from correlation? And uh, well, this is random performance. It's F one of of twenty, uh, and you can see that GPT four is below thirty. So it's a little bit better. It's a little bit better than purely random, and maybe somehow surprisingly, but uh, MNLI is is actually better than GPT-4. So we can see that this. Uh, so we can see that this this thing. Uh, so we can see that those models. I'm sorry, I got distracted by the chat. I will I will reply in a second. Uh, so we can see that those uh, those models they don't perform very well if we test. They, their actual reasoning capabilities rather than they their recall from recall of examples from training data. Okay, so let me pause here for a second and answer some questions. Uh, Vivian is asking what were those three things on the ladder again? Associations, associations, interventions, and counterfactuals. And uh, and answering a question, one more thing came to my mind uh, that I think can also help us uh, get a better grasp of what is going on there with those with this ladder of causation. Doing a, a short detour from what we're talking about now, uh, that every rung in the ladder of causation requires a a, a more a, a richer description of the system. So to say something about correlations, we just observe the data and we can compute some correlation coefficient or I don't know, like mutual information coefficient and so on. And that's all what we need. If we want to talk about on, on interventions, we either need to intervene, intervene in the real world. And these, these are, for instance, A-B tests or randomized control trials, or we need some knowledge about the structure of the data generating process. We need to understand which variables impact which variables, not necessarily all of those. It depends on different um, conditions, but we need to know something about the structure and then we can translate it to statistical queries. And when we go to the counterfactual, to the counterfactual level, we maybe need some interventional da data at least, and then some information about the structure and maybe some in, in uh, also observational data, and then maybe we can say something, but for sure we can say something if we understand the structure of the data generating process, so we know which variable impacts which variable, and we know the functional forms of the, those impacts. Then we can generate counterfactuals in a way that is not approximate, that is not um, in a form of bounds, but they can be they can be precise. So associations, they don't require too much knowledge about the data. This, the system description is not needed. Interventions need, uh, interventional rank needs some notion of the structure of the data generating process or actual, or actual interventions in the real world. And counterfactual level either requires us to have information about the, the entire data generating process, including the functional forms, or it requires us to provide uh, a mixture of interventional data and observational data, and then we can get some bounds in some conditions, I should say. So I hope this clarifies a little bit for you, Vivian, and I know that's a lot to unpack, uh, but the simple answer is associations, interventions, and counterfactuals. 
אוקיי. אוקיי, we had some more comments, but now we will, we will move forward because we still have a lot of stuff to, uh, to cover. Okay, so, so let's go back to this. So what we said is that although it seemed very promising uh, how large language models behave in counterfactual reasoning under, under more examination and more systematic examination, it turns out that they actually perform closely to, to random. And so the authors of this paper, they continue that the, short, uh, the, the models, models achieve almost close to random performance. This shortcoming is somehow mitigated when we try to repur repurpose LLMs for the skill via fine tuning, but, it also, but they also fail, but they still fail to generalize. They can only perform causal inference in distribution settings when variable names and textual expressions used in the queries are similar to those in the training set, but they fail an out of distribution setting generated by perturbing those, those queries. So, so what's the so what what would be the, a unifying perspective here? So one idea comes from this paper called "Causal Parrots: Large Language Models May Talk Causality, but Are Not Causal," offered by Matej Zechevic and Moritz Willig from uh, Technische Universität Darmstadt in Germany, and they propose that. Large language models are, are, are learning something that they called correlations of causal facts. So maybe there is some data generating process, some real world process, and this real world process can be uh, somehow described by physical measurement, and it can also be described by language. And so there will be a correlation between the physical measurement and those textual statements, textual descriptions, and if we have enough information in those textual descriptions, then large language models will be able to say something. And so they say there is this idea of correlations of causal facts. And they say that in a nutshell, these correlations of causal facts, they allow large language models to, in a sense, learn a trick that allows them to talk ab about counterfactuals, even though they they don't have any any they were not able to perform interventions in the real world and so on and so on and they don't have necessarily the the entire model so that's one hypothesis uh, another perspective here and i don't want to say hypothesis but but actually entire another perspective comes from andrew lampin and from deepmind and Andrew released this paper with, with his colleagues uh, some time ago called Passive Learning of Active Causal Strategies in Agents and Large Language Models. And as you can see, we're talking about observations or correlations and then interventions and so on. And here he, he's slightly changing the language. He says, he says passive learning and he says active causal strategies. Why is that? So the main underlying idea here is that passive data is not necessarily observational data. What does that mean? This means that if we train a large language model on almost everything that we have on, on the internet, then a lot of the data on the internet will actually be interventional in a sense. So maybe we have a discussion forum. In this discussion forum, one person reacts somehow to what another pe person did. Um, then maybe we have scientific papers. And so in a scientific paper, we'll have a description of intervention or a series of intervention. And so those models might perhaps learn something from this. And Andrew and the colleagues has actually shown that language models trained on only passive next word prediction can generalize causal intervention strategies from a few shot prompt containing examples of experimentation. So if we provide those examples of experimentation in the prompt, they will be able to actually correctly generalize causal interventional strategies. But we also need to provide them with explanations and reasoning. And you can see that the, I think, what's the color? The fuchsia, the fuchsia slash purple uh, performance is much better. Uh, especially in the in the held out set, which is which is outside, it, it has a different distribution. It it, it, it has a dis different distribution than um, the training the training data. So here, if we 
add explanations and reasoning and those uh, prompts are constructed in a certain way, the model is performing better. And so that's really, really great. But there, there's one more thing that we need to remember about, about here. And this is that the data here was, was clean. So there was like a particular structure of the data set, uh, of the training data set and in particular structure of, of the test data. And so if we ask the question that we started with this section, we started the section with, uh, we should say that given today's training regimes and data, the answer to the question, if LLMs can reason causally is no, but sometimes they can learn shortcuts that can lead to useful outcomes. What's the challenge here? The challenge is that we have no way to automatically detect when large language models are useful and when they are not, which outputs are useful and which are not. And I see that Betty is saying in the chat that I did not answer her previous question. So let's get back to her previous question. Um, perhaps a better way, there is a strong probability that John's ache is caused by drinking his coffee. Yeah, of, of course, in the real world, uh, in the real world, we probably would rather, uh, we would rather be interested in a distribution of effects than in point identifying an effect and there's um so i'm not sure i'm not sure betty if that was your question or should i look for something more because it's pretty difference between causation and correlation mm -hmm. why does he use the word uh -huh, listen i think this we addressed it was just a comment yes okay uh, so if you could, uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff going on here in the chat. If you could uh, share your question again, uh, Betty, uh, the question that you would like me to answer, that would be very helpful for me. So if you can post it again in the chat, that would be great. Appreciate it. Okay, so let's talk about LLMs and, and the question, if they can be helpful in the context of causality. So there are, let's say, two different streams of causal NLP. One is about questions about the world, and this is related to a question, can large language models understand real world causality? And the second one is related to the questions about the model itself. So if we change something in the model, maybe a state of a neuron, what, how, would, would, how would that impact the, the outputs of this model? So we'll, we'll focus on the, on the first um, type of of well causal NLP to stream of the causal NLP, uh, and we will be interested in in using language models to help us answer some questions about real world causality. And we can within this stream ask two questions: Can large language models be used as a part of causal inference process? And the second question is: Can large language models help us learn? causal structure behind some data generating process. So let's start with the first one. Here, here are, there, there are many uh, options here. We will only focus on one. And, and this option, this idea comes from the tech, from the paper called Adapting Text Embeddings for Causal Inference from Victor Veitch, Dania Srida, and David Bly. And the code example that we'll go through now is also described in, in, the, in my book uh, in chapter 11. And you can find this code from the chapter. If you scan this QR code, this will uh, redirect you to a GitHub repo and a notebook for chapter 11. And the code is in the section called transformers and causality, I think. Okay, so the architecture that is introduced in this paper is called causal BERT. And the idea here is that we have, and then the idea here is that we have pre-trained transformer layers here marked in those like yellow shapes. And then on top of this, we have three disjoint heads. Okay, so all the signal from the pre-trained transformer layers goes to each of those heads, and then we will somehow combine this information. So the first head is only trained 
uh, I, I need to take a step back here. So the, the problem statement here is that we have some treatment and this treatment is binary. Okay, that's the, and that's important for this particular ar architecture, which means that we either we either we, we we either administer treatment to a unit, a person, a sentence, whatever that would be, or we don't. And so, if we do, we have a special head that is being trained on those observations that that, that were uh, that had treatment with treatment value equal equal one. Then we have another head that is trained only on the observations with treatment values equal to zero. And finally, we have the third head that is uh, trained on the information, on the probability. This is so-called propensity score. And propensity score means the probability of th that the treatment is equal to one given some feature vector x. This feature vector can be anything. And here, this is our embedding, right? That comes from this from this yellow yellow stuff and now we'll propagate we'll we will back propagate all the information from those heads through those layers and this will help us uh, enforce those embeddings to be congruent with interventional distribution rather than observational distribution and you can see also you have this tau head of x and this tau head of x is the causal effect. And causal effect is defined as, as oh, it didn't work uh, the way I want it. Let me, okay. And so the causal effect, we call it tau of x, and x is our feature vector. Oh, I'm so sorry. It doesn't look very good. It's tau head to be consistent. That would be, the outcome, the expected value, the expected value of the outcome, y, given do uh, t equals one. And do is the special operator that allows us to express interventional queries in statistical language minus. That's the best I can do with my, with my, with my mouse here. Okay. So this is expected value of the outcome given that we set treatment to one in interventional sense minus expected value of the outcome given that we set the treatment to zero. Okay. And then we can translate this to a purely statistical query without those two operators. And this model is actually helping us to do exactly to do exactly this okay great so what does what the, what does this model learn uh it learns document level embeddings it learns mappings from embeddings to propensity score and mappings from embeddings to the outcomes and here once again we have the same architecture just with slightly different notation, and this is on purpose. And just let me go to the chat very quickly and see we have a number of the comments and questions here. So let me read them and, and reply to them. Betty writes, there was no question. I was just thinking that expressing as probability would allow the model to have other new possibilities rather than be stuck in one only from the past. Okay, so yeah, so this is uh, this is a good comment, and and I think we could have a very interesting discussion here, because there are basically two different uh, things going on here. So we we have the structure uh, of the data generating process that the model, well, we, we we assume that the model follows, and then we have the st statistical um, estimation on top of this, and your comment is very good. We can have some uncertainty. Regarding uh, regarding the structure itself, and we can have some uncertainty regarding the estimates of uh, statistical parameters. And in both cases, thinking in terms of distributions rather than or, or probabilities rather than uh, rather than point estimates, it might be very uh, very beneficial. So I think this this that's a great comment. Unfortunately, we won't have time to go deeper into this. 
Mm, but yes, in, in principle, I agree. And then Kenneth says, what are the pre-trained transformer layers and disjoint heads? Is the transformer layer multi-head attention plus dense network and the disjoint head is a multi-head attention block? Okay, so pre-trained uh, transformer layers are transformer layers as in BERT. So they are multi-head attention layers, as you said. And then those heads will be dense, actually, dense layers. So there is no... As far as I remember, this particular um, this particular implementation, th there are only dense layers, maybe a number of dense layers, like a dense block, basically. So I hope that answers your question. The word head is ambiguously used for both as attention heads and output heads in GPTs and LLMs. Yes, so these are output heads. These joint heads would be output heads um, put on top of the of uh, of attention layers, where. There, there are some heads as well, of course. Very good comment. Thank you for clarifying this. And then we have Embatia. Seems like we are putting a band aid or lipstick on a design level shortcomings in the LLM. Um, I would not agree with this because, like, we will see in a second what's the purpose of this model. So it will play a very specific role in in a causal in a set, in a in a particular causal inference setting so let's see this and let's see if that uh, changes your mind embatia mm. and if not i'm happy to discuss this uh, in a second and finally we have martial attention heads are internal to gpt transformer the output head is the last stage that uses the transformer stack to categorize on all sentiment or predict next token Yes, yeah, so we can think about this. Uh, so yeah, so these are not atten so these these joint heads again. These are just stacks of layers. Um, and if I remember correctly, in this architecture, we only had dense layers there. Um, so that will be quote unquote output heads. So three disjoint output heads that are modeling some different quantities. Uh, and here they will they will learn those quantities that we discussed. So propensity score and outcomes um, and, and potential outcomes for treatment, under treatment and under no treatment. Okay. Uh, okay, Kenneth said, thanks. What is the design level shortcoming? So that's, yeah, that is fundamental. This is probability context or short context oriented. Okay, so yeah, so I, I think there are some shortcomings to... Um, transformer architecture but this we won't have time to dive into this although that's very interesting and there's so much research on this you know, we could talk for hours great so let's get back to the architecture quickly we have distal bird in this particular paper then we have mlm which is uh masked language model loss this is a one of the loss components here so we will have so we will have three different losses here then we have this G function, and the G function is the loss component that comes from propensity score. So how well a model was able to predict the propensity score based on the um, on the representation. And then finally, we have this Q uh, that is a loss component coming from those heads that are modeling the outcome under treatment and under no treatment. So that's a lot of information, I know, but let's uh, let's keep let's keep moving. Very important, as in any uh, causal inference uh, problem or in any causal inference solution, we have some assumptions, and so here assumptions are no hidden confounding, which means that we assume that there are no um, variables that impact our treatment and impact our outcome that we do not observe. Positivity, which means that for any set of X, so for any value of the, um, the feature vector, the embedding, the probability of treatment is, is higher than zero. That's an important assumption as well. And finally, no leakage consistency, which means that there is no, if we, if we ad administer treatment to one unit, one person or whatever, one post, this does not impact other posts or other people in our data set. So these are three assumptions. So these are three assumptions that are important for this architecture if we want to have 
and guarantees that the the outcomes make make sense the outputs make sense okay so let's talk about the the configuration this the setting here so here we will use uh, a configuration in which we treat text as confounder. Text is a confounder here. And the problem here is, so confounder, what does it mean, confounder? Confounder means that it has it has um, impact on the treatment. So confounder has impact on the treatment and on the outcome. And if something like this happens, if we are interested in the causal effect of treatment on outcome, which means this effect, we will need to control for this confounder. And so we have many different uh, we have many different ways to do it, but if if our confounder is text, that becomes very difficult because text is super high dimensional. And how do we actually extract those dimensions? And so it turns out that using causal BERT, we can do exactly, we can do exactly this. And so here's one um one example scenario where we could uh, where we could use something like this so we have text and here we will we will say that text comes from reddit it's uh yeah reddit it comes from reddit and then we have some perceived gender of the poster and this is the number of upvotes so we are interested how perceived gender of the poster impacts the number of upvotes a given post is getting but the text itself, maybe the topic or how person writes this, their style also impacts the number of upvotes. So how, do we, how, how can we control for this? Well, that's the answer. We can use causal BERT for this purpose. And the assumption here is that the text is impacted by true gender and also perceived gender is impacted by true gender. And so we cannot observe, if we only look at the post uh, on, on, on a given subreddit, we actually don't know the gender of a person, right? Um, as long as they haven't decided to, uh, to share this information. But we assume, let's assume for the sake of this example that this is unknown. So that's why we have this like dashed uh, line here for unobserved variable. So, so this impacts the text itself because maybe people with one gender write slightly different or have slightly different probability distribution over, over topics, over words, and so on and so on. And it also impacts the perceived gender, so how people present themselves. And so this is a confounding, but now it turns out that if we control for text, we'll block the path, the confounding path here. Uh, and so we will be able to estimate the effect that we are interested in, that is, the effect of perceived gender on the number of upvotes. And so if you want to learn more about this, um, if you want to learn more about this, why this is like this and so on and so on, this topic is called causal identification and I discuss it in my book and also you can find it in a paper that is called bad and good controls. Good controls and bad controls maybe or bad and good controls. It's a very good paper that will tell you how to think about those things. Okay, so how to how to put it in the code? So we'll use uh, in, an implementation of causal BERT uh, that comes from read present, but it will be a modified version, and this will be important for you. Uh, this modified version you can find in the in the in my books repo, and this will be important because the original version contains an, an error. And this error can lead to a bad results. Okay, so our problem setting here will be we'll have some Reddit data set. This is fake data, I mean synthetic data, we should say. Um, and we have the text. We have um we have if a person has a female avatar or not. We have if they have a photo in the post and the photo attached. And we have upvote, and this is our outcome. So this is our outcome, and um, and their female avatar is our treatment. So this is something that will generate the gender perception in somebody who will upvote or or decide not to upvote. Great. So there are three steps here. First, we instantiate the model. We basically just say causal BERT. 
we define the batch size. In most cases, when I work with this model, eight worked well, but this might be different for your case. Then we have those three different weights. So these, these are related to loss functions. So once again, use the version from the repo if you want to uh, use this model, especially in like production setting. Uh, and then here are the three different losses that we talked about. Propensity score loss, outcome model loss, and mask, lang mask language model loss. So like a regular regular loss for, for BERT. And you can weight them. And this weighting worked very well for this particular problem. But again, it can be different for, for your problem. And finally, we train the model using, using the, the train method. We provide the text. We provide additional confounders. We had this has photo. That was our additional confounder. And then we have female avatar, which was our treatment. And finally, upvote, which was our outcome. And we train only for six epochs, sometimes four, sometimes eight, sometimes maybe 12. Uh, seems to work reasonably well for, for most problems. And then finally, we predict. We predict using the inference method. We only uh, provide texts. And uh, and confounds additional confounds, and then the model will generate for us a quantity called average treatment effect. And so for our data set, it will say the average effect of our treatment, which was um, female avatar, on our outcome, which was number of upvotes, is equal to something. Okay. Um, so very important, we need causal identification for causal bear to work. And then we also have another, so th this is something you will find in the presentation uh, later on. And then we have also, we can use causal, dis causal um, large language models for causal discovery. So discovering what is the structure of the data behind the data generating process. Um, this needs to be done with caution um, so please be careful. You can find my blog post on this topic here. And if you want to hear about uh, applications in industry of this kind of stuff, here's my conversation with Ishanj Gupta from BMW Group. Uh, and the podcast episode is available here. So feel free to check it out. And uh, you will also hear in this interview what you should be aware of. And, and short, long story short, it should never be fully automated at this stage. We always need human supervision, but we can actually make our processes more efficient. 